Hello, let's look at the treatment of unipolar depression. And today we will deal with the treatment that we do in the beginning, meaning initially, because there exists also treatment that we do continuously after we have treated the patient initially, meaning a maintenance treatment. And then we have a treatment for patients that are resistant to treatment. Then we need to step up our game here. And the initial treatment is based on something called remission. So we, we, the goal of our treatment now is to get a patient into a remission. And the, the definition being that we have a patient that is symptom-free for more than two months. That's our goal. And we can see this patient. We have a patient in front of us. He has a lot of symptoms. We, we give this treatment. And now we see that the patient does not have any symptoms for more than two months. Then we can call him a depression remission, okay? What score is needed in the PHQ-9 test to say it's a remission? This is a very good test. It's a questionnaire. I have dealt with it in another video. Please check that out. It's a very important video. We have nine questions that we can ask. And why is this important? Because we can standardize our way of looking at symptoms. Because it's easy to say, yeah, the patient has symptoms. The patient has no symptoms. But it's easier if we standardize this process and then it's easier to see the pattern. He had five symptoms out of these nine questions. Then after the treatment, he only had two of them. We see a pattern. It's a decrease there. It's a more standardized way of thinking. And if we have less than five points in this PHQ test, then we can call it a remission. This is a very good objective way to deal with this problem. So we have a questionnaire nine question, as we said. We give some points, and if we see less than five, then we have a remission. The type of treatment that is the most effective is not medications alone, not psychotherapy alone. It's a combination of both. So please do a combination therapy. Do these two things together, medications, psychotherapy. Never go alone for one treatment. Of course, there exists mild depression and then one can only do psychotherapy and that is enough. But in most of the cases, we need medications also. Should medications or psychotherapy be used for patients with mild symptoms? This is what I talked about. No, we can give psychotherapy alone. So when you see a mild patient, then go for psychotherapy. When you see a severe patient, do a combination therapy. Is group or individual psychotherapy better? Because there exist different types of psychotherapy. Do you think it's better to have a psychotherapy in group or individually, actually individually. That's a more efficient way when we're dealing with uh, depression. But group therapy are very good and it's actually a standardized way of doing things in the hospital. So usually when a patient is in the hospital, usually the patient gets group therapy, but also gets uh, individual uh, psychotherapy. Let's look at the medications now because we will not deal with the psychotherapy in this presentation. Here, the treatment will focus on the medication part, and then we will do some other videos discussing the different types of psychotherapies. The first generation antidepressants means that they were produced first. Second generation means they were produced after that. So the first generation antidepressants, these are the older ones, tricyclic antidepressants and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So tricyclic antidepressants, here we see just a picture of a receptor. I will not go into the specific details of how this works because then this presentation would be at least one or two hours long. So let's face it that with, with these tricyclic antidepressants are somehow related to the nerves and receptors. And these are grouped in the first generation um, antidepressants. And tricyclic and tetracyclic the name comes from the structure of this medication. So tri means three, tetra means four. So it means that we have a four or three ring structure, structure because cyclic is a ring. And we will see how it looks like. For example, these are the tricyclic and tetracyclics. We have amitriptyline, amoxapine, clomipramine, desipramine, doxepine, imipramine, maprotiline, nortriptyline, protriptyline, and trimipramine. A lot of interesting names, 
a lot, uh, it's hard to memorize, I know, but remember, tricyclic, tetracyclics, or first generation, please remember that. We have amitriptyline, and here you see the structure, you see this three rings. It says three cycles. Okay, the maximum dose, please notice, of amitriptyline is 300 milligram. So whenever, as you as a doctor or as a patient, please don't take more than 300 milligram daily. Or as a doctor, please don't give more than 300 milligram daily. And usually this dose should, of course, be divided. Usually you don't give 300 milligram, you divide it. But the importance here is that you give it daily, not more than 300 milligram. Amitriptyline, it's a tricyclic antidepressant, first generation one. So here, once again, to highlight it, this is a tricycle, 300 milligram, you can remember it, three, three cycles, three rings, maximum 300 milligram in 24 hours. Amitriptyline, first generation antidepressant, please remember that. Amoxapine, that's also a, a beginning with A, amoxapine. Here we see four rings, you see, one, two, three, four, tetracyclic. The maximum daily dose of amoxapine is 400 milligram. Easy to remember, four rings, 400 milligram. But please, of course, we will see other medications that have three rings and four rings, but they will not have 300 milligram and 400 milligram. I'm just trying to co uh, make connections for you so that you can remember the numbers. So we had a tricyclic, which was called amitriptyline, and this is a first generation antidepressant, and it has three cycles, tricyclic, and its maximum dose is 300 milligram. Here we have amoxapine, which is also beginning with A. It has four cycles, it's a tetracyclic, and it has then 400 milligram as a maximum daily dose, okay? Clomipramine. Clomipramine, three cycles here, and we have luck here, we are very, very lucky, 300 milligram. It's a tricyclic 300 milligram daily dose. Then we have desipramine, three cycles, three, and we are lucky again, it's also 300 milligram daily maximum dose. So please remember, until now, all the tricyclics until now had 300 milligram maximum dose. Okay, doxepin, also free, 300. So this is the connection I wanted to, you, to, you to remember because then you will never forget it, okay? And if, of course, there will be maybe medications that are tricyclic and uh, does not have 300 milligram. Imipramine, three cycles, 300 milligram, once again. Maprotilin, 225 milligram. This is something else, you see? So, in general, we can say three cyclics usually have a 300 milligram dose. Here, maprotilin will have 225 milligram maximum dose. Nortriptyline will have 150. You see, it's half. So, this is an example of when this rule is not anymore a rule, but instead a pattern that we can see. So, nortriptyline, 150 milligram daily. Protriptyline, also three cycles. 60 milligram, protriptyline 60 milligram. How much was uh, maprotiline? How much was nortriptyline? Please check this video many times and then you will remember it. The first ones we know, 300, 300, 300, 300, 300, yeah? Trimipramine, 300. Trimipramine, 300. And you see they look very, very similar. Good, that was tricyclic antidepressant. Then monoamine oxidase inhibitors, let's check that. This is also first generation, the molecule looks like this. It's a very beautiful picture of that. We will not go into the specific uh, mechanisms here. We will deal with that in other videos. Here we have isocarboxazid, phenylzine, selegiline, tranylcypromine. Isocarboxazid, phenylzine, selegiline, and tranylcypromine. Isocarboxazid looks like this. And maximum daily dose is 60 milligram daily. Phenylzine looks like this and has a 90 milligram daily dose maximum. Selegiline looks like this and has 12 milligram 
Then we have tranylcypromine here that has 60 milligram. So let's check that once again. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Let's rewind. We'll rewind. And we will now ask. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors is what? It's the first generation antidepressant together with these tricyclic antidepressants. Tricyclic antidepressants usually had 300, 200, 150 milligrams maximum daily. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors have less isocarboxazid. Remember four isocarboxazid, phenazine, selegiline, and tranylcypromine. Isocarboxazid had 60, 60, isocarboxazid 60, phenazine. 90, a little bit more, phenazine 90. So isocarboxazid 60, phenazine 90, selegilin has 12. So we have isocarboxazid 60, phenazine 90, selegilin 12 milligram, and then tranylcypromine 60 again. So which, which of these had 60? Isocarboxazid had 60, phenazine 90, selegilin 12, and tranylcypromine 60. Isocarboxazid and tranylcypromine, the first and the last one here, has 60 milligram maximum. Phenazine has the highest of the mono, mono, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Phenazine, 90. Selegiline, the least one, 12 milligram. So you see, I'll try to give you the patterns and then you will remember it um, better. This is rote memorization, I would say. And unfortunately, you cannot remember those. Uh, of a medication without making some rote memorization. So you, you need to do it. Good. Second generation antidepressants are actually medications that were discovered later on, and they will call it second generation. We have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, then we have serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, then we have atypical antidepressants and serotonin modulators. So we have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You see, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot about serotonin here. We have serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We have serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake, reuptake inhibitors, atypical antidepressants, and serotonin modulators. So one can say that the second generation antidepressants are somehow related to serotonin. Remember that the first generation was monoamine oxidase inhibitors or tricyclics. Let's look at this. Selective serotonin, we usually abbreviate it as SSRI. SSRI, second generation antidepressants or SSRIs, somehow related to serotonin. We will name some now. If I ask you, name some. You will name six SSRIs. Citalopram, escitalopram, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, paroxetine, and sertraline. Citalopram, escitalopram. These two sound similar. Then we have fluoxetine and fluvoxamine. These are beginning with F. Then we have paroxetine, which is also similar to fluoxetine. And then we have sertraline, which is something, something else. So you see, citalopram, escitalopram. Let's look at citalopram. Looks like this. A very big molecule. Maximum dose, 40 milligram. Then we have the high dose of citalopram being given. What did we say? 40 milligram. What can happen if we give a high dose or even higher dose? which is not allowed, acute interval prolongation. Therefore, therefore, it's so important that we remember what is the maximum dose of a medication because if we don't do that and we give too much of it, what will happen in, for example, citalopram, acute interval prolongation. And what does this mean? You have your heart. This is an ECG of your heart in red. And there you see your patterns of the ECG. And we have some Q wave here, QRS. And the Q wave here and the T wave here is then enlarged, the, 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 the distance between these. And what happens is that your heart can stop working. Because if the interval is getting more and more and more, the heart has no time to repolarize, one can say. That means this, this, this wave here is a repolarization. That meaning it rests. If, if it has no resting phase and the new phase comes, then the heart cannot really really deal with this. And then you can get, get problems and you can die. Okay? So please, QT prolongation is very important with citalopram because if you increase the dose too much, you can get that. So if the patient have 
acute prolong prolongation already in the ECG, then please never give acetalopram without monitoring the patient, so without checking. So I would say, please avoid medications that are prolonging the acute interval even further. What is the maximum dose of citalopram in patients with this type of liver enzyme? This is CYP2C19, C19 liver enzyme. What is the maximum dose that we can give? 20 milligram. Do you remember the maximum dose with we said was 40 milligram. Here we see that 20 milligrams, so half of it, is the maximum dose. If we know that the patient have a, a liver enzyme, with which is called CYP2C19, okay, because that will increase the QT prolongation otherwise, if we increase the dose further. So please remember it: liver, 20 milligram. If we have this type of enzyme. Name some advantages with citalopram and citalopram. Low drug to drug interactions. Look at these pictures. We have a lot of interactions between these uh, medications. So if you give, give a lot of medications to patients, unfortunately, this will interact with each other and we can get a soup, uh, a soup of all kind of side effects. And therefore, the good thing about citalopram and escitalopram is that we, we don't have so many drug, drug to drug interactions. And that's pretty good. So acetylopram, as we said, and acetylopram have a uh, lower amount of drug-to-drug -drug interactions. The maximum dose of acetylopram is 30 milligram. Citalopram was 40 milligram. When we had this enzyme, this liver enzyme, then it was 20 milligram. And uh, here in acetylopram, we have 30 milligram. Okay? Fluoxetine is another type of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So SSRI, fluoxetine, maximum dose being 80 milligram of fluoxetine daily. Fluvoxamine, it looks, looks like this, has a maximum dose of 300. You see, remember, fluvoxamine is higher than fluoxetine. Paroxetine, what do we have here? 50 milligram. Paroxetine, 50 milligram. Then we have sertraline is something that is also related to higher dose, like fluvoxamine, 300 milligram. So out of these, I would say that sertraline and fluvoxamine have the highest dose. 300 milligrams. Citalopram had 40, 20 when we had this liver enzyme, then escitalopram had 30. Okay, what, which type of selectin, uh, what type of SSRI is most widely prescribed, do you think? All, of all of these, so if you are a doctor, and we, you know that we have second generation, second generation antidepressants, and you know that it's somehow related to serotonin. Good. Now you're in a good path. What type of SSRI do we know? We had this list that we had. Citalopram, escitalopram, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, sertraline. You, all, you know all these names now. And what, which of these do you think is the most prescribed one? Which is the most important that you should remember? Sertraline. Interesting. So sertraline and uh, that... That does not mean that this is the best medication. It just means that it's the most, most prescribed one in the world. Okay? Which two types of medications in combination from the SSRIs is the best? Which, which two types of medication in combination is important? Not which two medications are the best. Which two medications in combination are the best from the SSRIs? Sertraline and escitalopram. Sertraline and escitalopram. Which medication was the one which was the most prescribed one? Sertraline. Escitalopram, how many, how many milligrams is the maximum dose? 30 milligram. So these two in combination is the best combination. Well, uh, so then we have serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake, reuptake inhibitors. This is also related to serotonin, as we hear in the name. These are our second generation. Let's look at what type of serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors do we have? Venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, duloxetine, Levo milnacipram and milnacipram. Okay, so we have some uh, similar names here. Uh, we have two up there that is uh, ending with vaccine, or, the, or we have actually venlafaxine is the ending of the second one also, desvenlafaxine. And then the, the last two there have uh, uh, something which is ending with milnacipram, and the lev is added there. And this is added to the venlafaxine. So this venlafaxine and levo, levo, 
Milna Cipran. And then we have Dulek Cetin. This is, as you hear, the name is very similar to the SSRI that we had, Fluex Cetin, but it is not related to the same thing. Uh, this is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So the antidepressants are very hard to memorize, actually, because the names are so not logical and it takes some time to get used to it. But if you look at this presentation, not once, not twice, if you look at it five times, I promise you that you will be able to tell me which are the SSRIs, which are the serotonin neuropenephrine reuptake inhibitors, how many, uh, how many milligram is the maximum dose of each, which type of group is it, first generation or second generation, and so on. You will tell me which one is the most pr prescribed one, you will tell me which, which two combinations are the best of, of SSRIs and so on. So please look at this video many times. Venlafaxine looks like this, maximum dose, 375 milligram. 375 milligram. This venlafaxine is not having 375, 400 milligram, almost the same. This venlafaxine, we added it a little bit, okay? So you remember venlafaxine, 375 milligram, and then you add a word which is called the des, and then suddenly we have 400 milligram here. Duloxetine, 120 milligram, a little bit less. Duloxetine, 220 milligram. How much was venlafaxine? 375. How much was des, des venlafaxine? We added this des, 400 milligram. How much was duloxetine? 120 milligram. Now lo let's look at the levomilnaziprane. milna Levomilnaziprane, maximum dose 120. Sound similar? Yes, because 120, we had it for duloxetine, we had it for level milna ciprane. Let's look at milna ciprane. How much do we have here? 300 milligram, 300 milligram. So uh, just by looking at this chart now, do you know the dose? Venlafaxine, how much? 375. Desvenlafaxine, add a little bit, 400. Duloxetine, 120. Levo milna ciprane, how much was that? I will not tell you. Milna ciprane, how much was that? you need to concentrate. The best way to look at my presentations, in my opinion, is if you have a piece of paper and pen and then you write down things, you write down the doses because that is making you actively involved in this presentation. Never look at pre presentations just passively and not, not just my presentations. If you look at anything on YouTube, that is 40 minutes long and 50 minutes long and you take some notes, then you can just check, check your, your little paper here and then you remember everything. You don't need to look at the video many times. But when it's this complex, I would rather suggest you to look at the video many times. So let's, Milatsipran, how much was it? 300 milligram. Okay, let's look at atypical antidepressants. Atypical is also second generation. We will not go into the details of how they work. Bupropion and mirtazapine. These are atypical agents. Bupropion and mirtazapine. Bupropion, as you see here, have a very interesting dose. We have never seen this before. 450 milligram. 450 milligram for bupropion. Then we have the advantages. What is the advantage? No sexual dysfunction. Good. This is something we want as men. We are showing thumbs up. No sexual dysfunction with bupropion. Mirtazapin, what do we have here? Daily maximum dose of 60 milligram, 60 milligram, not 450. So atypical medications here, we had bupropion and mirtazapine, bupropion being 450, mirtazapine 60 milligram, bupropion having no sexual dysfunction. Side effects of mirtazapine here, what do we have? Dry mouth, very dry mouth with mirtazapine, drowsiness, so watch out when you're um, driving your car and you are taking mirtazapine. Sedation, almost the same thing. Hyperphagia, eating more than usually. And weight gain. These are mirtazapine side effects that you need to watch out for. Okay, I will not deal with all the side effects of all medications here. I just want to highlight some. And then we will deal with uh, more videos explaining each of the medications. Serotonin modulators. Serotonin modulators. What do we have? Nefazodone, trazodone, vilazodone, vortioxetin. You see, these are ending somehow with zodone, zodone. Nefazodone, trazodone, vilazodone. Nefazodone looks like this, has a maximum dose of 600. 600. We have never seen this before. 600 nefazodone. Trazodone having a dose, looks like this, having a dose of 600 also. So it's very easy to remember this. 
the serotonin modulators here have 600. What did tricyclics have? 300. You remember? Three cycles, usually 300. Four cycles, usually 400 milligram. Serotonin modulators, usually 600. Let's look at villazodone. Villazodone is 40 suddenly. Okay, so we had 600, 600, and then 40. This is this this requires not so high dose, and usually this is good when we have medications that requires low dose. These are these are advanced uh, medications that uh, that that can. That it's, it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, at least, it's important that you don't give many medications, and it's important that you don't give too high dose of every medication, because as we said, the the interactions that medications have with each other can explode. Yeah, you will have too many interactions and then the patient comes with the side effects and you never know uh, what type of interaction caused this. And it's very hard to actually find out. You, of course, you have computer systems, you have uh, some uh, uh, lists that you can combine different medications and then you can find that, for example, one medication together with that cause this symptom, that medication with the other cause the other symptom, of course there exists, but this is time consuming. So I would say it's better to have less, less, less medications and less, less, less dose. Okay. Vortioxetin, 20 milligram, even less, more advanced medication. Good. So we had SSRI, uh, this was second generation, we have serotonin modulators, we have the serotonin norep norepinephrine reupt reuptake inhibitors, and the atypical ones. What is the most prescribed antidepressant, do you think? SSRIs. And we, we, we stated that the most common SSRI was sertronin. So... One can say that which type of medication is uh, the most prescribed antidepressant, sertronin. Because we have selectin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors being the most commonly prescribed, and out of the select SSRIs, we have sertronin being the most common. SSRI, please remember that. Common side effects of antidepressants. Diarrhea, vomiting, sexual dysfunction, somnolence, and weight gain. Diarrhea, in it's easy to understand. You take these medications and then you see that the patient gets diarrhea. He, he complains of, uh, about that. These are common side effects, uh, unfortunately. Vomiting also. So diarrhea, vomiting, sexual dysfunction. Which one did not have sexual dysfunction? Bupropion. What type of antidepressant is that? Atypical. Is atypical second generation or first generation? Second generation. Is bupropion the most commonly prescribed Antidepressant, no. Which one is the most commonly prescribed group of antidepressants? SSRIs. Which type of SSRI is the most commonly prescribed? Sertraline. And sexual dysfunction is not caused by bupropion. Somnolence can be seen by antidepressants and weight gain. So weight gain, somnolence, the sexual dysfunction, and diarrhea and vomiting. These are common side effects of antidepressants. Which medication causes more commonly diarrhea? So we have diarrhea for antidepressants, but which is the most commonly, uh, not, not most common, but more commonly? This is sertraline. And which medication was the most commonly prescribed antidepressant? Sertraline. And this is an SSRI, as we said. More commonly causing diarrhea. So the most commonly prescribed medication, sertraline, is causing diarrhea more commonly. So this will be common in the patient group that is having depression, that they also have diarrhea because they take this sertraline. So sertraline, please connect that with diarrhea, which is more commonly causing vomiting, venlafaxine. Venlafaxine. Remember that, venlafaxine, vomiting, which is less commonly causing sexual dysfunction. You know, all the, you know this already. Bupropion. Exactly, bupropion is causing less common. Which is causing more commonly somnolence? Trazodone, trazodone. And you have maybe already forgot which type of group this belongs to. Please check the video once again. Uh, which medication causes more commonly weight gain? Mirtazapine. When you think of mirtazapine, weight gain. When you think of sertraline, diarrhea. When you think of bupropion, less sexual dysfunction. Okay, mirtazapine, weight gain. With which dose do we start with antidepressant therapy with? Lowest dose. We said we like when, when we have lowest dose and when we have 
as less medications as possible. Please start with one. Yeah, exactly. How long does it take for antidepressants to take effect with improvement of patient symptoms? So how long does it take for the antidepressants to take effect with visible improvement of the patient symptoms? Two weeks. Usually it can take longer. But usually we see in two weeks an improvement of the depression. Good. So here we have just a chart showing that doctor gave this medication to patient and after two weeks he starts to feel better. For how many weeks do we treat depression with antidepressants? Usually 6 to 12 weeks. So you see, usually it takes two weeks for getting better, but we don't stop the treatment there. We usually give it for six weeks, and then we'll check how it's going. And usually, unfortunately, we give it for 12 weeks. Okay? So 12 weeks. So the patient has to count with having a per persistence, with having patients, that the medication will not treat the patient so quickly as he thinks it can take time he can maybe he will maybe be in the hospital for six weeks or uh, 12 weeks it depends all on the patient what is the treatment of anxious unipolar depression selective serotonin reappetic inhibitors with anxiolytics so ssri with anxiolytics for anxious unipolar depression sounds logical so ssris plus anxiolytics what is anxiolytics? Name some. Benzodiazepines. We like clonazepam, lorazepam. So anxiolytics. Then we have benzodiazepine hypnotics, like zolpidem, esopiclone. Then we have second-generary antipsychotics, like quetiapine and iripi, aripiprazole. Then we have pindolol, buspirone, doxepine, and rilozole. So benzodiazepines, like clonazepam and lorazepam. You see their structure is so, so similar. As you see, these medications are actually looking very similar and they are very similar. You, you see here, here's an OH group and here is no OH group. For example, just what I'm seeing here. Here's a chloride and here is ni uh, nitrogen and so on. So you see, it's, 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 it's a difference in small, small structures, small, small molecules. And these small differences make a huge difference in the function in your brain and in the function in your body and the in the way that they interact with the receptors. Known benzodiazepines like Zolpidem and Esopiclone. Then we have second generation antipsychotics like Quetiapine and Aripiprazole. Why did I emphasize psychotics, antipsychotics? Because this is not second generation antidepressants. It's second generation antipsychotics. That's something else. We, have not, we are not dealing with that here. Quetiapine and aripiprazole. Then we have pindolol. Let's look at this. Pindolol. Then we have buspirone, doxepine, and riluzole. Okay, I will not deal with the specifics of all this because that would take the whole day. We will make shorter videos about each instead. Name some psychotherapies that are used for unipolar depression. These are a list. We will not deal with that in this video, but I want you to remember that. We have cognitive behavioral therapy. We have interpersonal psychotherapy. We have behavioral activation. We have family therapy, problem-solving therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and supportive psychotherapy. The psychotherapies that is most studied is the cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal. So cognitive behavioral therapy and the interpersonal psychotherapy is the most commonly studied one, not the best one. Okay, that's the difference. Most studied one. The same as sertraline is the most prescribed one, but that does not mean that it's the best one. Sertraline is not the best one, just because it's most prescribed. What type of treatment is very useful for a fast response in severe depression? Electroconvulsive therapy. Now you get shocked. What is this? Does this exist? 2020? Do we really do electroconvulsive therapy? Yes, we do because it's effective. It's, it's not a joke. Electroconvulsive therapy is effective against severe depression. I know that many, many, many people have seen movies and it looks so dangerous that you have some wires, electric wires, and then you're shocking the brain. But nowadays, it's not going like that. You have an you have an anesthesiologist there. You are uh, actually having no type of 
these movements or creating electric shock because the, the patient is completely uh, in sleep. Okay, he's he's hypnotized by the anesthesiologist, and then he gets an electro uh, electric. Uh, convulsive therapy and in that way it's a very f fast treatment effective treatment for severe depression what type of medication are best for severe unipolar depression we said electroconvulsive therapy is very good but ssris here no no not not SSRI. serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors serotonin norepinephrine okay what is a good alternative to this serotonin norepinephrine reuptake we have mirtazapine what, is the, what did mirtazapine cause as a side effects? Weight gain, weight gain. Do you remember? Weight gain. Which, why are tricyclics usually not used initially? Which was the tricyclic? This was the first generation one, which had three cycles, which had usually 300 milligram maximum dose. Why is it not used initially? Because it has more, more side effects, more severe side effects. And which type of side effects? Something related to the heart, and overdose. So cardiotoxicity and overdose is more common with tricyclic uh, initial. And what type of medication do we use in mixed features, unipolar depression with mixed features? We have second generation antipsychotics, lithium, dil, divalproex, lamotrigine, and luracidone. So second generation antipsychotics used in mixed features, antipsychotics, not antidepressants. Then we have lithium, lithium, and we have Divalproex, mixed features, Lamotrigine for mixed features, and Luracidone for mixed features. That was it. So now you can stop the video, relax, or you will go with, with me for a ride and take a quick review of what we talked about. And I will do it much, much quicker now because now you have some base knowledge. So unipolar depression, we can deal with it initially, maintenance treatment, and for those who are resistant. We will deal with initially here, the definition of remission being that we are symptom-free for more than two months, symptom-free for more than two months. The PHQ test that we can do is uh, showing us that the remission is there when we have less than five points. Less than five points, a PHQ-9 test is showing us a remission. Then we know that the patient is in remission. The most effective therapy is when we combine the therapy with the medication and psychotherapy. Medications and psychotherapy can be used in combination, but in mild symptoms, it's only enough to do psychotherapy. Psychotherapy and mild symptoms. Group or individual psychotherapy is both are both good, but we rather prefer individual psychotherapy. It's more it's, it's better for the patient. So individual psychotherapy is the best one. The first generation antidepressants are tri tricyclic antidepressants and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The tricyclic antidepressants or amitriptyline, amoxapine, clomipramine, desipramine, doxepine, imapramine, maprotiline, nortriptyline, protriptyline, trimipapine. Now I made a rap song here, almost. So amitriptyline, maximum dose 300. Amoxapine, maximum dose 400. Clomipramine, maximum dose 300. Desipramine, maximum dose 300. Doxepine, maximum dose 300. As you see, I'm repeating myself. Until now, the amoxapine had 400. Uh, all the rest had 300. Imipramine, 300. Maprotiline, 225. Remember this one. You remember all the 300 except maprotiline here, or except uh, amoxapine, which was 400, and maprotiline has 225. Nortriptyline, we had 150, so half of it. Half of it. Nortriptyline is only half of it. Protriptyline, we had 60 milligrams. Very, very, very lower. Okay, we are dividing it with five. So the rest is 300. Then we have amoxapine 400. Then we had this maprotiline 225. And nortriptyline being half of it, 150. Protriptyline being only 60 milligrams. And then trimipramine, how much? 300 again. This is the usual. So actually, you should remember the, the do, uh, dose that are different than the, than the other one. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, we will have less dose here. Isocarboxazid had only 60. Then we have phenelzine had 90. You remember? 90. Then we have seligilin was how much? 12, I think. 12 milligram. Then we have tranylcypromine, which was 
again 60. As you see, very a trend here also. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors having around 60 or 90 or 12, but two of them have 60. Then we have the second generation antidepressant. We have selectonin and serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is SSRIs. Then we have serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Then we have atypical antidepressants. And then we have serotonin modulators. So selectonin serotonin inhibitors are second generation SSRIs. These are citalopram, escitalopram, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, paroxetine, etc. Then cetilopram being uh, 40 milligram dose, which is maximum dose. Then we have acute interval prolongation when we give a too high dose of citalopram, which can actually kill the patient. And then 20 milligram when we have a liver enzyme that is CYP2C19, that is actually then causing an increased QT prolongation that patient can die. So watch out with citalopram here. The best advantage with citalopram and escitalopram is that they have a low drug-to-drug -drug interaction. So they are, don't interact with the drugs uh, of other drugs so much. Escitalopram, we have here a maximum dose of 30, so not 40. Fluoxetine have a maximum dose of 80. This is very interesting, 80. Fluvoxamine have a maximum dose of 300 milligram, like the three cyclic ones. And paroxetine have also a dose of 50. So you see, it's a, a total different uh, thing here. Sertraline, which was the most commonly prescribed SSRI, have 300 as the three cyclic ones. So many, many medications here have 300 milligram as a maximum dose. Good. Selective serotonin inhibitors, sertraline. Remember that, most, mostly prescribed. The combination with, that was the best SSRI is sertraline and escitalopram. Then we have the serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Here we have venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, duloxetine, levomilnaziprim, and milnaziprim. This is a serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Venlafaxine, maximum dose 375 milligram. Then we added this DES. Then we had 400 milligram suddenly. Duloxetine, we had 120. Levomilnaziprim, we had 100, also 120. So we can say that uh, Duloxetine, Levomilnaziprim have both 120. Milnaziprim have 300 again as the three cyclic ones. Good. The atypical antidepressants, I want you to remember two atypical antidepressants. What do, do we have? Bupropion and mirtazapine. Bupropion have a maximum dose of 450 milligram. Then we have no, dis, no sexual dysfunction, which is very good. Bupropion is good for guys that want to produce. And then we have mirtazapine and mirtazapine maximum dose 60 milligram. And what is interesting with mirtazapine, we have side effects like dry mouth, we have drowsiness, we have sedation, we have hyperphagia, eating a lot, and weight gain, gaining weight. So that is mirtazapine. Serotonin modulators, we have nefazodone, trazodone, vilazodone, and vortioxetine. Nefazodone having a maximum dose of 600, highest one until now. Trazodone having a dose of 600, also very high. And these are all serotonin modulators. Remember, serotonin modulators have a very high dose. But then we come with some generation, some uh, development, and vilazodone shows us a 40 milligram maximum dose, which is very good. Then we have a vortioxetine, which shows an even better 20 milligrams. And we reduced it from 600 to 40 and now to 20, which, which is very good. Let's look at the most widely prescribed type of antidepressant, which is an SSRI. We know, we know that. Good, SSRIs. Most common side effects being diarrhea. We're having vomiting, sexual dysfunction, somnolence, and weight gain. And the, mo the medication that's causing diarrhea is more commonly sertraline. We have venlafaxine is causing vomiting. Then we have, so venlafaxine vomiting, VV, you can remember that, like that. Then we have less commonly causing sexual dysfunction is bupropion. Bupropion, as we said, and somnolence is caused by trazodone more commonly, trazodone, and weight gain by mirtazapine, mirtazapine causing weight gain. With which dose do we start with antidepressant therapy? We will always be the lowest dose, and then it takes an effect about two weeks, okay? One to two weeks, and it takes effect, and we treat the patient for about six to 12 weeks. The treatment for anxious unipolar depression is not only SSRIs usually, but with anxiolytics. And anxiolytics are 
benzodiazepines like clonazepam or lorazepam or benzodiazepine hypnotics like zolpidem and esopiclone or second generation antipsychotics like quetiapine and aripiprazole and we have pindolone, buspirone, doxepine and rilozole. So benzodiazepines like clonazepam, lorazepam, zolpidem and esopiclone, anxiolytics, these are all anxiolytics. Then we have quetiapine and aripiprazole, quetiapine, aripiprazole. So if you're an anxious patient, anxious patient, with depression, then you take these medications. Quetiapine, aripiprazole, or pindolol, or buspirone, or doxepine, or rilozole. We will deal with these medications in another video. Psychotherapy that are used, we can have cognitive behavioral therapy, we can have interpersonal psychotherapy, behavioral activation, family therapy, problem solving therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and supportive psychotherapy. The types that are most Type of psychotherapy, the most studied one is cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal psychotherapy, but that does not mean that this is the most effective one. These are just the most studied one. The type of treatment that is very useful is the fast response in severe depression being electroconvulsive therapy, which is very stigmatized, but it's very good in its functions. Please don't be afraid of electroconvulsive therapy. I know it sounds horrific, but it is actually a really good treatment option. What type of medications are best for severe unipolar depression? It's serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake, reuptake inhibitors. So for severe ones, we use electroconvulsive therapy or the serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors. Good alternative to this being mirtazapine, but watch out for weight gain here. Three cyclics that are not usually used initially is because we have more severe side effects with that cardiotoxicity and overdose, okay? Type of medication that we use in mixed features is second generation antipsychotics, lithium, difval Proex, lamotrigine, and lunacidone. These are used for mixed features. And that was it. I know this is a huge um, topic, a huge presentation, and it's a lot to take in. But please, you know this. Only by looking at this presentation, once I know that you know at least 50% of what I have said to you, hopefully. If not, then I need to make a better job next time. But if you look at it two times or three times, you will know it 100%. Okay? So take care, have a nice evening, and bye-bye.